So real quick, I just want to say that I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I thank the church here for allowing this, me this opportunity, and I trust that we'll be able to uh, satisfy the expectations of anyone who uh, was part of the decision to ask me to come here. And I want to thank you for the invitation, and I want to commend to you the speech that we just heard from uh, Brother Corder. Well, I'd like to begin this morning by reading from the First Corinthian letter and verse uh, 16 and 17 of chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul says, uh, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For, though, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now the title that was assigned to me this morning is Worship Fundamentals, the Lord's Supper, the bread which we break. And so this morning what I'm going to be doing is looking at the concept of breaking bread as the expression is found here and there throughout the New Testament scriptures. And I'll attempt to address as I go along the various questions that were given to me a couple of months back. And if I don't touch on them all, well, it's just because I didn't feel like I could quite do it all, but, but we can address them later if, if need be. All right, so the expression breaking bread, I find in the scriptures to refer sometimes, as we all are aware, to an everyday meal. This was just sort of an idiom that was common, apparently, in that time among the Jewish people. In Acts 2 and verse 47, for example, it says there, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Here we find that the term uh, breaking bread is used here in the context of the words daily and that they ate their food. And because they ate daily and ate their food, I take this to be a reference to the breaking of bread being a reference to an, a common meal or an everyday meal. Also in Acts chapter 20 and verse 11, we're told there that when he had come up, that is Paul back up to the third floor, and had taken bread, or excuse me, broken bread and eaten, he talked a long while, even till daybreak, and then he departed. All right, so here it is used in the context of he, and this seems to be a reference to an individual action, and then also the reference to eaten seems to respect, the, be used in respect to the eating of an everyday meal in these two passages of scripture. I realize there's some uh, op possibility of open to interpretation on some of this, but this is generally the way I understand the passage, and I think it probably generally is the way that we have understood them through the years. But I also find that breaking bread refers to the Lord's Supper, and this I think probably is more what we're interested in today. And so we find it used this way in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, where the Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, the expression here, breaking of bread, is coupled with the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and prayers, which seems to be more related to the edification, spiritual edification of the church, and so we take the breaking of bread here to be a reference to uh, the eating of the Lord's Supper. Same is true with Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, where the record there says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, and he was ready to depart the next day, spoke to them, and continued his message until midnight. So in this case, the breaking of bread here is coupled with the first day of the week and the gathering of disciples. And this, of course, indicates that famous and uh, well-established historical practice of Christians gathering on the first day of the week for spiritual edification. And that seems to be, therefore, that the breaking of bread in association with that would be uh, the Lord's Supper, as well as the fact that Paul spoke to them and continued his message, which indicates uh, spiritual edification through teaching of the Apostle Paul. So these passages, these four passages, illustrate uh, the difference in terms or the difference in application of the same term, I should say, uh, to the Lord's Supper and to everyday meals and everyday eating. Now, as we go in more detail to the Lord's Supper, 
we need to point out the fact that apostolic practice says a great deal about how to apply the accounts as they are given in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In other words, we don't get all the answers simply by isolating Matthew or isolating Mark or isolating Luke and trying to come up from those individual passages what our practice should be. In other words, we need to look to apostolic practice so that we will be able, in other words, to uh, see the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as it were, through the lens of how the apostles later applied those passages and those ideas. And not just in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23 through 25, but also uh, Paul there explains more in verses 26 through 34 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16 and Acts 2 and Acts 20, as we've already pointed out. So in other words, we need all of Revelation on this point. And we should not isolate a phrase and attempt to understand it apart from what else the Bible says about this particular topic of the breaking of bread. And we know this, this is a hermeneutical thing that we've understood for years, but I think it does need to be mentioned and reiterated from time to time. Also, as we'll see, the Lord's Supper is established during the context of the Passover, so the Passover also, even from the Old Testament, can have some bearing on our understanding of what our practice should be as the children of God. All right, now, among the passages that you see on the screen, there are a couple of them that contain the expression on the lips of Jesus, this do in remembrance of me. Now, this expression, of course, indicates that when Jesus uttered these words, he was intending that his model or his actions would become the model not only for the disciples sitting in his presence on that night, but also for the church in the future whenever the church became, uh, into, came into existence. And so we need to keep that in mind as well, that these are indeed models of what the Lord intends us to do, but we can't isolate one, we have to take them all collectively. Well, I want to begin then looking at the passages of Scripture that have to do with the institution of the Lord's Supper. And I use the word institution in the verbal sense to mean when Jesus instituted it. That is, when he set it up, when he first modeled it, if you will, to his disciples. And as we all know, probably, uh, this took place during the Passover meal. So we need to keep that Passover meal in our mind, at least in the back of our mind, as we proceed through our study of these passages. Now, the Passover meal is described, or at least mentioned, I should say, in Matthew 26, 26. It's really not mentioned, it's only alluded to. It says there that as they were eating, and then the passage goes on to say that as they were eating, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Okay, now we know he was eating the Passover because earlier in the passage, in the same chapter, it says in verse 18 that Jesus instructed his disciples to go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And then it goes on in verse 19 and says, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. And that's just exactly what they did, and that's what we find to be the case, that as they were eating, they were eating the Passover meal. And when they were eating the Passover meal, that's going to give us some idea of what we should do as well as, as we um, uh, take this account of the Lord's Supper as our model of worship in the church. So as they were eating, Jesus took bread. Now, when Jesus took bread, therefore, since it's in the Passover, then we understand that Jesus took Passover bread. And when we say Passover bread, we mean unleavened bread. Let me read you a little definition, uh, if I may. Leaven is defined as an agent, such as yeast, that when added to batter or dough, causes it to rise through the process of fermentation. And so unleavened bread is bread that is made without such a leavening agent and, or any other leavening agent. And uh, therefore, that's the bread that Jesus took and that's the bread that uh, he intends for us to take. Now, the Passover ordinance, as you well know, demands this. You have to do this, at least as far as the Old Testament account of the Passover is concerned. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 15, which is 15 centuries before Christ, 
God told the children of Israel, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats, un whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And then, of course, right in the very context of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, it says there that it was the feast of unleavened bread. So we, again, I guess I keep it reiterating the same point here, and that is that Jesus would have honored this ordinance. And hence, the bread that he took was unleavened bread. So as they were eating, he took unleavened bread. Now, most of you in the room today probably know that the little word artos is the Greek word for bread as used in this passage of scripture. Now, let me invite you for just a moment here to consider that, like we said, we should read these accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke through the lens of how the apostles applied it in the church. So, if we look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17, the New American Standard Bible tells us that the word artos when it has a number in front of it, should be translated loaf. This is something that I think James McKnight pointed out 200 years ago. And so the New American Standard Bible renders it this way. Since there is one loaf in the assembly of the disciples, assembly of the church, then we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Now Jesus said that uh, this loaf, this bread, is my body. So the one loaf is the one, or symbolizes or represents, the one undivided body of Jesus Christ, according to Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. And what's important here, as far as this singularity is concerned, is that in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uses the single loaf as the argument for the unity of the church. He took the single loaf in the communion as a given in based on that given drew the conclusion that the church at Corinth should not be divided. And hence, the significance of the loaf in the communion is that Jesus, when he took bread, took unleavened bread and took a loaf of unleavened bread. Let me say a little bit about the typical significance of the Passover. What I'm doing here this morning, uh, maybe I should clarify, is that I'm taking a little strand of thought here and a strand of thought there and another strand of thought and we're going to keep pulling these together and then toward the end we're going to tie and wrap it all together so if you can sort of hold your thoughts in the details that we're presenting here in a kind of uh, suspension then we'll, uh, we'll tie it together in a little bit. But the typical significance of the Passover I don't think can be overlooked in all of this relating to the bread and the breaking of bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, For indeed our Passover, Christ our Passover, was sacrificed for us. This tells us in the language of apostolic inspiration that the Passover has a connection, a typical significance to the death of Jesus Christ. Now, more than that, it's alluded to even by John the Baptist earlier on when he saw Jesus coming upon the scene and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in addition to that, uh, it's no, uh, no coincidence that Jesus was crucified on the Passover. And all of this is not coincidence. It's all divinely orchestrated, providentially fulfilled in the death of Jesus Christ in this respect. So then, in the typical significance of the Passover meal, we need to remember that the lamb of the Passover sacrifice was a kind of symbol or foretold, I should say, as typical of the cross of Jesus Christ and that the Lord's Supper looks back to Christ or looks back to his death upon the cross, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses, uh, verse 26, that you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I'm pointing out the fact here that since there is uh, this typical connection between the Passover and the death of Christ, and the Lord's Supper looking back to the death of Christ, then we should expect there to be some kinds of similarities between these two ordinances. And the similarities must not be overlooked, ignored, or denied, because it is clear that these are indeed connected to the death of Jesus Christ. Let me read a passage as 
from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, which many of you are familiar with, of course, that speaks about the lamb of the sacrifice of the Passover. Uh, speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Note here that the, it is to be a singular lamb, and that lamb is to uh, be for one house. Notice, moreover, that if the household is too small for the lamb, then that household needs to be adjusted. Let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. Uh, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. All right, so when we look at it from this standpoint, we can see that the lamb was not to be divided into parts, and it was to be divided only in the eating, and not only that, but the household consuming each particular lamb in the Passover observance was to be adjusted to the lamb and not the lamb to the household. Well, you know, this house is small. We don't need this whole lamb, so let's cut it in half. You all take part, we take the other. No, that was not what they were to do. They were to move the folks over to the, to the smaller house in order to adjust the house to the lamb. All right, now, that's sort of a strand of thought that we're going to weave in here as we go. But it says in Matthew 26, in verse 26 again, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And not only that, but he blessed it and broke it. Now, this blessing, I'm not going to say much about. This is not really... I don't think directly related to my topic, so I'm just going to say it just means that he gave thanks under those conditions. While they were observing the Passover meal, Jesus began instituting the Lord's Supper, and he began to give thanks for the various parts of that supper. Now, it says he broke it. Okay, now, this is where the questions begin to come up. What does it mean that he broke it? Now, some say that what it means is that Jesus broke the loaf in half. That is to say, he actually tore the loaf down the middle. In fact, there are churches of Christ who practice and contend for this practice of, of uh, breaking the loaf down the middle. You'll also find that uh, some movies depict this. You know, uh, if you see on-screen depictions of the life of Christ, they'll have Christ pick up a loaf of bread and sometimes that loaf is obviously not unleavened bread. It looks like something that came from the bakery down at Panera. And it's not unleavened bread in some of these movies. And then Jesus tears it in half. And uh, sometimes it's not clear in the movies just where it goes from there or how, what happens after that. But like I said, some churches of Christ do practice this practice of the brother waits on the table, gets up and gives thanks for the loaf, picks it up and then tears it in half and puts it back on the plate and sends the plate around the room to the other communicants. Now, it's very uh, easy sometimes for us to fall into to, uh, to pejorative names for people. They call us one cuppers, you know, and we jokingly call ourselves that sometimes. And sometimes uh, we call the folks who make this practice bread breakers. Well, I don't particularly care for pejorative terms, but bread breakers is a good uh, convenient way of describing in, in one word what we're talking about here. So I just want to clarify that I'm not trying to be pejorative. I'm just making the point that bread breakers is a good term simply to identify what we're talking about. So sometimes the folks who practice the communion this way are described in this way. And let me go on. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed, too, is that translations sometimes give us different impressions about what broke it means. We were talking about translations earlier. And the New Living Translation, which is really a fairly modern translation, only in the last 20 years or so, uh, really is the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the descendant of the Living Bible, but it purports to be more of a translation than the Living Bible was back in the early 70s. But anyway, the New Living Translation, which I've taken it upon myself this year to read, just finished it, and I'll have to say, like Brother Quarter said, uh, if you read it as a commentary, it's a great commentary. In fact, when you read the Old Testament, there's some great renditions in the New Living Translation. That doesn't mean I'm in favor of preaching out of it, but I'm saying that as a 
as a, as a commentary, a lot of times it can shed a light or two on this or that passage here and there. But because of what it is, it also has its pitfalls. And one of them, I think, is Matthew 26, 26, which says, And as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces. Now, at first, this was kind of jarring when I first saw this, but I thought, well, is that really any different than breaking it in half? If you break it in half, then that's two pieces, isn't it? But really, when I look at the expression, broke it in pieces, if you break a coffee cup in pieces, you don't typically think of two parts. You think of shattering it or breaking it into multiple pieces. And so this is, the, this is the picture, as you see on the screen here, that the phrase, he broke it in pieces, conveys to my mind. And so when I look at this, I think, well, what about this? Maybe this is the right way. Or, you know, the translators are very smart people, and so maybe they know something that we don't know. Well, either way you do it, whether you break it in two, or whether you break it in pieces, it looks to me like that there is one of two things that must follow from that. The first thing I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, and this is the one that some churches of Christ practice. And that is that if the breaking it in half, or even the breaking it in pieces, but let's go with the breaking in half, if, if you go with that, then the breaking of bread becomes a special act done by one person in the assembly. In fact, those who practice the breaking of bread or the, uh, the breaking it in half, I should say, do just that. They tear it in half and then they send it around the room and they don't consider the people who are taking a portion of what's left and eating it, that's not the breaking. No, according to this point of view, the breaking is in the tearing it in half, which means the brother who's tearing it in half is the one who's breaking the bread and everyone else is just eating, you see. So it's a special act done by one man. Now, in response to that, I'd like to point out that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17 says this, and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And uh, because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. I can't hardly see my underlining on this screen up here. Okay, so uh, the point I want to make from this passage is, is starting at the bottom down here, we all share the one loaf. So there are people in the communion service who share the one loaf, and Paul says that's all of us. Now, up above, he said, the we and the we who are many. So the we are many, and the we are all. Now note, up in the previous verse, we have we break. So the we below is the same as the we above. Or to put it another way, the we who share the loaf is the we, the many, who break the loaf. And we're left with the inevitable conclusion that breaking, therefore, cannot or is not a special act performed by only one person. But everyone must break. Now the question is, are we breaking it in more pieces? Are we breaking it in more halves if we're going to continue breaking? And I'd like to address that as we go along here. But first of all, one objection that I'm aware of in response to what I've just presented here with the orange arrows and such. And that is, someone says, well, look, you just haven't read all of verse 16. You need to read the first part of it as well as the second part. The cup of blessing, which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And so someone who is an advocate of the tearing the loaf in, the half, in half will say, well, look, you know, down here you said we break means all of us. But look, when the brother gives thanks for the loaf, it's only one person. And yet Paul says, we bless. What about this? Well, my response to this would be this, that prayer and breaking are two different acts, not just two different acts, but inherently different kinds of acts. A public prayer is an inherently collective act, or it better be, 
We need to be praying with the brother who prays, and his words of blessing become our thoughts of blessing. And when his words of blessing become our thoughts of blessing, then we all collectively break, excuse me, bless the cup and bless the loaf. So when the brother prays, we all pray with him. But listen, if only one brother breaks, then we do not. So I'm left with the conclusion that the breaking of bread surely cannot be just done by just one person in the assembly. Here are a couple of scenarios. One of them I know is practiced in churches. One of them I have heard is, but I'm not 100% sure. But here's scenario one. Let's just go back to the Lord's Supper in the night that Jesus was betrayed. And let's say Jesus did this. And this is hypothetical. Jesus breaks the loaf in half, gives both halves to the first disciple who breaks off a small piece from one of the halves and eats, then passes the halves to the next disciple until all are served. Like I said, some churches practice this. You know, I'm actually thankful that the church here gave me this topic because I've had these thoughts about the possibilities and the different scenarios that could have taken place when Jesus broke the bread in my mind, but I've never really traced them out. And so you're going to get the result of me finally sitting down and tracing this out and thinking about the different ways this could have happened. All right? So like I said, what I just described is some of the uh, the practice in some, a few at least, I don't know how many, frankly, churches of Christ. So here's Jesus. Here's the 12 disciples. Jesus takes a loaf. After he takes the loaf, he gives thanks and he breaks it in two, tears it in half and passes it to the next disciple. Then he says, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. All right. Then the first disciple takes the two parts, and like I said, some, in some churches, those two parts are put back on the plate, and the plate is passed around with the two parts, and the people eat from it. And so, as uh, each person takes both pieces, and it gets passed around, everybody eats a portion all the way around, all the way around the room, all the way around the communion. I just escaped out of my PowerPoint presentation here, pushing too many buttons. Well, I should be pushing one. I'm the fingers moving around. But you see the point here is that as you go around the table, everyone breaks. Or excuse me, everyone eats. Because we're still talking about breaking here being an individual act. The rest of these folks didn't break. Only Jesus did, uh, according to this point of view. Now, the question is, what's wrong with this? Well, I've kind of already answered these questions, but let me just t say it again. First of all, there are three things wrong here, but one of them is breaking is done by only one person, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, that we all break. The second thing is, the disciples did not do this. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And not only that, but it destroys the symbolism, because look, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. This is Paul's argument that that the church needs to be whole and singular. Why, Paul? Well, because the loaf is whole and singular. And if you tear it in half, you're not preserving that wholeness and you're not preserving that singularity. And I might remind you, too, that the Passover lamb has a bearing on this. Surely it does. The Passover lamb was not to be divided, but it was to be divided in the eating. And we're going to maintain that the loaf ought to be divided in the eating as well. But we'll get to that. Scenario two, like I said, some churches may do it this way, and I don't know. But uh, someone said something to me in the past few weeks that led me to think that some churches might do this. But here's Jesus and the disciples. Here's the loaf. He breaks it, and he gives it to separate people. And then says, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And then those pieces get passed separately around the room. I don't know. Does any church practice this? I don't know, maybe some of you do. But really, when it comes down to it, whichever way, it's still the same thing. We still have the three same problems here. The breaking is done by only one person. And Paul says, we break. Uh, the disciples did not do this. And also it destroys the symbolism, as Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 17, demands that the loaf be whole and singular. And let's not, again, let's not forget the Passover lamb. All right. Now, as I understand it, 
Those who hold this position in the churches of Christ about the breaking of bread rely quite heavily, apparently, upon the statement of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 24 and the, break, uh, the broken body. The King James Version and the New King James Version, both of which are based upon the Textus Receptus, which was composed of manuscripts that originated anywhere from the 12th to the 14th centuries, a long time after the, first, uh, the New Testament was first written, uh, it says this, And when he had given thanks for the loaf, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, some of you may have noticed that in some of the newer versions that is based upon a different Greek text, a Greek text that is drawn from much older Greek manuscripts, read like this, and I'm going to give you the NASB, but it's just representative of most of the other new versions besides the New King James. It says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the difference here is that the word broken appears in the Textus Receptus, uh, the, the Greek text that the King James was based on, but in the critical text, or the ones based on the older manuscripts, the word broken does not appear there in that text. And the contention by the textual scholars is that the, the, the one on the bottom here is based upon the older and more reliable manuscripts, and hence Jesus just says, which is for you, and broken would have been a later uh, interpolation. Now, we can get into that. It's textual criticism, and it's pretty technical. But for the variance, if anyone's interested in this, you can bring it up and, and ask a question, and I'll try to answer it. Uh, here are the variants and the issues that uh, pertain to that appearance of the word broken versus the non-appearance of the word broken. But my point is that if we're going to rely on 1 Corinthians 11.24 so heavily as part of our practice in the communion, there's a couple of problems. Number one, it's based upon, as I've just pointed out, an uncertain textual variant. But maybe more significant, let's just leave broken in there. And that is more significant is the fact that broken in 1 Corinthians 11 and 24 is a metaphorical use of the word broke. It doesn't mean that Jesus' body was literally torn in half when he was crucified. It's metaphorical. It means that he was broken, I think it's Thayer that says, broken here in the sense that he experienced a violent death. So broken in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 is a metaphorical use, but our brothers who rely upon that passage for the breaking of the loaf in half are using a metaphorical use of the term break to substantiate a literal practice of breaking the loaf in half. In other words, they're trying to make the loaf into two parts based upon the statement Paul says Jesus' body was broken, a broken body, but Jesus' body was not torn in half. It wasn't. Now, beyond this, the concept of Christ's body being broken seems moreover at odds with, or inconsistent with is a better way to put it maybe, with John 19.36, for these things took place so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. Again, that's a literal concept of broken, where broken in 1 Corinthians 11.24 is metaphorical. But be that as it may, uh, my second point here about John 19.36 is assuming that uh, broken is the uncertain textual variant. And so we should not use a <laughs> metaphorical broken to prove a literal breaking. But let me go on. I'm back to this chart again, where we came to the, in the middle of the chart there, it says one of two things follow. The breaking becomes a special act done by one person. We've eliminated that, I think, by looking at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. But then here's the other possibility. If breaking in two or breaking in pieces is the way that Jesus did it and expects us to do it, then, then we don't take it as an individual thing that only one person does, but we draw the conclusion, well, then every communicant repeats what Jesus did. That is, every communicant breaks the loaf down the middle or in pieces. The problem is, this results in absurdity. 
And bear with me. Uh, I had more fun with this. This is more fun than it is really exegesis of the scripture. But I think it's important really to think these things through. And that is, there are more scenarios, in other words, that are possible here. And these are the ones that I had fun sort of tracing out. So let's think about this for a moment. Uh, scenario number three says that Jesus breaks the loaf in half and gives two halves to two separate disciples. Then each disciple first eats a small portion, then breaks the whole in half and passes it to the next disciple. Let's say that happened. Here's what it will look like. You've got Jesus and the disciples. Jesus takes a loaf, he breaks it in half, and then he gives part of it to one and part of it to another and says, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what they do. They go through and they uh, each partake and then they break it in half. And they pass on maybe one piece to the next di disciple and another to another. And those disciples get their pieces and they eat a portion and then they break it in half. And then after they break that in half, they pass it on to the next disciples. Now, the problem you've got in this scenario, though, is you've got eight pieces now and only six more disciples. And so you've got two pieces that are left over here. Two pieces left over. Now, these eight dis or six disciples now eat a portion and then they break theirs in half. Okay, they're all finished. Now when you get finished then, what you have are 12 disciples who have consumed bread and 14 pieces remaining of that one loaf that you started out with. Surely, my friends, this is a distortion of what Jesus did. Now what about this? Well, it's clear that everyone eats, everyone breaks but the symbol, uh, symbolism of singularity is obviously destroyed. Bear with me. Let's go another. Jesus breaks the loaf in half, gives each half to a disciple. Each disciple breaks their piece in half. Each one eats one of those halves and passes the other half to the next disciple. It's kind of like this. Uh, I need to look at the right screen here because I'm not sure. Let me fix this so I won't keep doing this. All right, so it, here's Jesus, here's uh, the disciples, here's his loaf, he breaks the loaf, then he passes one to one and one to another and says, do this in remembrance of me. And now what happens is this disciple breaks it in half and eats half of it and then passes the next half. And then the next disciple does the same thing. And you keep passing this around until eventually you get to the last disciple who finally breaks it in half again and eats one of those halves. Now, what about this? Well, it's clear everyone eats, everyone breaks, but the symbolism, again, is completely destroyed. And not only that, but you have a very difficult logistical problem here, and that is that the bread will need to be very large to start off with. We just had only 12 disciples. And did you see how small those pieces are when you got to the last two? Now, if we're going to have this many disciples, or if we're going to have 40 disciples, we're going to need a big old piece of bread about the size of four large pizzas from Papa Murphy's to start off with, and then the last person's barely going to have any, if any is left at all. So you know, those at the beginning will eat a lot of bread. They'll eat a quarter of that loaf, and those at the end may not have enough. Well, let's go with scenario five here as I hurry. Jesus breaks the loaf in half and gives each half to two separate disciples. Each disciple takes a small portion to eat, then breaks the remainder in half and passes the pieces to the next person. Each person will receive more halves than the previous person, all of which will need to be broken. So it looks like this, and it gets absurd. Like I said, this runs into absurdity as you keep con considering the implications of what happens here as you keep on going. These disciples are going to have 12 pieces, and then they're going to pass those 12 to these, and those tw tw uh, two are going to make it 24, these are going to make it 48, these are going to make it 96, and this is only with 12 communicants, and you're going to have 192 pieces when you finish. This doesn't work either. So what about this? Well, in addition to the destroyed symbolism, the absurdity is obvious. All right? So, next, quickly. Jesus breaks off a piece of the loaf and for each person and gives it to them individually, maybe. Maybe this happened. Well, maybe they did. Passed it off this way. Jesus broke it in pieces. That's what the NLT says. Is that what happened? You know, the NLT is trying to eliminate ambiguity here with their, uh, what they call natural language translation. But the problem is, is it just moves the ambiguity down a step. And you still got Jesus breaking bread in all kinds of different ways here. Well, the problem here is, here is that no disciple breaks at all. And 
So this is a problem as well. Well, okay, I've made my point, I guess. So there's only one other alternative, it appears to me, and that's the one I'm going to explore in the last five minutes and 41 seconds that I have. And that is, first of all, we have to deal with the question, did Jesus eat and drink? We haven't spoken about that, and this is part of the controversy, frankly. But I'm going to maintain that Jesus did eat and drink, and here's how. In Matthew 26 and verse 29, after instituting the cup, Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on. Now, if Jesus did not drink of the cup, why would he say this? I maintain that he's, this language here implies that he did drink of the cup. So Jesus drank this fruit of the vine, not some fruit of the vine of the Passover, not some fruit of the vine two weeks ago, but this fruit of the vine. I will not drink it from now on until that day I drink it new. Now, look at Luke 22, 20. After he instituted the, uh, the, the loaf, he said, likewise, he also took the cup. And the word likewise here is translated from a little word that just means in the same way or similarly. Couldn't be exactly the same because one was a liquid and one was a solid, bread and fruit of the vine. But then also, uh, whatever Jesus did with the loaf, we must conclude he also did with the cup. In 1 Corinthians 11.25, same thing. In the same manner, he also took the cup just like he did the loaf. Whatever he did with one, he did with the other. And whatever he did with the loaf, he did with the cup. But he drank the cup, therefore he ate the loaf. Now, with that in view then, Scenario 7, which is my last one. When Jesus broke the loaf, that means he broke off a piece and ate it as the model for what they should do. He then gave the whole to the nearest disciple while saying to all of them, Take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. That first disciple did what Jesus did and in turn passed the remaining whole to the next person to do the same. And this process continued until all had broken and all had eaten. I don't need to show you what this looks like because you've seen it every Lord's Day, most of you, all of your lives. You know what this looks like. And so this is the conclusion that we draw that took place on the night that Jesus was betrayed when he instituted the communion. So we draw this conclusion. They all did what Jesus did. Jesus said, do this. They all took. Jesus said, take. They all broke. Paul says, we break, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. All ate. Jesus said, eat, Matthew 26, 26. The loaf remains whole throughout, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17. And so we draw the conclusion that this is the practice that Jesus intended and did, in fact, model on that occasion. Wow, I'm coming down just right here. I have one more slide I want to show you. And I want to circle back to the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation, as I pointed out, says in Matthew 26, 26, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces. Now, the phrase, broke it in pieces, comes from one Greek word, the little word, klau, to break. Now, that's why uh, in the New King James and King James, they don't go on to say it in pieces, but just broke it. Now, the thing is, is this is an interpretive translation. No question about it. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not opposed to interpretive translation. In fact, in a sense, there is no such thing as non-interpretive translation. It's just that how much interpretation do you intend to use? And these translators, like was mentioned earlier, they set, their, they set their parameters and what they're going to do all in advance, and then they try to live up to that as they go through their project of translating. And so an interpretive translation, we have them in all translations. It's just that depending on the philosophy of the translation, there's more than others. So I'm not opposed to interpretive translation. But let me give you another interpretive translation from the New, Internet, the New Living Translation. Acts 27 and verse 35. This is where the Apostle Paul is on the ship, you know, going uh, to prison or going to trial in Rome. I got one minute and eight seconds. He's going to trial, and over there you remember that he took some bread and ate a common meal on that occasion. 
It says, then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all. Here's what the NLT says. It says, and he broke off a piece and ate it. Now, here's the, here's the catcher. And that is the little expression, broke off a piece, is an interpretive translation. And you know what? It's an interpretive translation of the very same word that you've got over in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. They're both interpretive translations. Now, it is true that the philosophy of the translators had something to do with why they chose one interpretive translation in one passage as well as another interpreta- interpretive translation in the other passage. And so I draw the conclusion that if these are both interpretive translations, then I can, in- I can translate Matthew 26, 26 with the same interpretive translation that they use over in Acts chapter 27 and verse 35 for another setting and another context. And so, that's the way I would translate that passage. Then he broke off a piece. And the implication is that he ate and told them to do the same, and they did. Well, it says end, so I guess I'm finished.